Good afternoon. It's a considerable pleasure uh, for me today to introduce our speaker, Neil Grigg. Neil joins us from Colorado State University, uh, where he is currently the director of the Colorado Water Resources Research Institute and also the International School for Water Resources. Uh, Neil comes here having just spent two very busy days organizing a highly successful groundwater engineering and management conference in Denver, which several of us had the uh, pleasure of attending, and it was a, a very well done affair. Uh, his teaching and research interests at CSU focus on uh, water resource planning and management, and he has a, a very uh, lengthy experience in that area. Uh, he's worked for over 25 years in the water resources area in a variety of academic, state government, and consulting capacities. Uh, and he's certainly no stranger to some of the more contentious uh, water issues in the western U.S., uh, having served as a special master, uh, a river master for the U.S. Supreme Court on the Pecos River, uh, which sometimes has been a little controversial between uh, New Mexico and, and Texas. Uh, today, Neil is going to bring uh, the breadth of his uh, perspectives on Western water issues for the 1990s to our water talk. Neil. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you, Steve. I sure appreciate uh, being here. It's been quite a while since I was in Laramie, and I, you know, I thought this would be a good opportunity to come back up here and see how much has changed since I was here last, and I noticed it hadn't changed a whole lot since I was here last. It's, it's good to be here. And I had nice weather for my trip up from Fort Collins. I thought I would um, present to you some information about trends in Western water issues that relate to water resources professionals uh, of an interdisciplinary uh, uh, issues of an interdisciplinary character, and maybe we could have some discussion about um, uh, where some of these trends are taking us because I think they really have uh, a lot of implications for our research and our studies, uh, programs, and our professional practice in the future. Now, as uh, down at Colorado State, I, I see that not everyone here is from uh, Wyoming, so I'd like to get some idea of where you all are from, so I might relate some uh, cases from other countries to, to my talk, too. And uh, maybe most of you are from Wyoming, but, uh, or the U.S., maybe I could get a little poll. Are you, where, where are you from? Uh, PRC or Taiwan? PRC. You're, don't look like Chinese. Okay. Brazil. Brazil. What city? Which city? Malawi. You know, we have students from Brazil and Malawi, and we're working together all the time. Okay. Well, I have one example from there. Ari, I know. Okay. <laughs> Pennsylvania? Southern Louisiana. Okay. India. Which part of India are you from? Uh, I'm British. Hyderabad. Mm-hmm. Wyoming. Reno. Taiwan. Taiwan. Okay. <clears throat> well, we, in most of our classes, have about the same distribution, except instead of Wyoming, it's, well, Colorado, or California, now Colorado, or something like that, you know. <laughs> We, most of us came here from somewhere else. But regardless of where we came from, we're facing some issues in the West today uh, that relate to water resources that are new and different. There are things that are, uh, we didn't face in the times when the West was being settled and most of the water projects that we're familiar with today were being developed. Uh, and Wyoming is very similar to Colorado in that sense. I'd like to uh, put this first little map here and I'd, uh, give you a, an idea <clears throat> about uh, the strategic location that we, as you, are in as it relates to water resources in the West. Um, this is one that we're working up down at the Colorado Water Institute. Uh, this may turn out someday to be the cover of a publication I'm trying to get done that would be called the Colorado Water Atlas. It's turned out to be a lot more work than uh, it should be, but that's why it hadn't been done before, but we're still working on it. And one of the things that uh, the Atlas would show is Colorado's strategic location as the headwaters of four major river basins. Uh, you can see those <clears throat> river basins, uh, the Colorado, which flows down here towards Southern California, 
the Rio Grande, which flows uh, down uh, into New Mexico and then Texas, the Arkansas here, and then the, the Platte River system, South Platte and North Platte, which flow into the Missouri and then into the Mississippi. And so down the Continental Divide, uh, you can uh, go from one side or the other of the watershed, and you can either go all the way to the Pacific or you can go to the Gulf of Mexico that way. Of course, Wyoming is in strategic position two. I noticed that the advertising from Wyoming is similar to Colorado as being the head of all the river basins, so we like to take advantage of the same things there. And uh, Steve mentioned the Pecos River that I work on. That's a, a river that heads uh, right in here and goes down into Texas, has that interjurisdictional conflict. And then, of course, your North Platte it goes into Nebraska. That's one of the examples of a interstate conflict. We we just have a lot of those kinds of conflicts uh, to deal with. <clears throat> Characteristics of the West are familiar to you. I thought I would show just a few uh, maps from uh, a report that I uh, have got about Western water. I've got a big stack of reports on Western water issues because I've been trying to track those. This is average annual precipitation, and uh, it's no secret to anyone here that um, all of the water is in the east, and the arid part of the country is in the west. Of course, there is water in the northwest. <clears throat> um, one of the myths of the, uh, that are abounding in the country today is that because they have so much water in, in the east, that that's a water-rich area. Well, it is a water-rich area, but uh, they're having as much trouble managing their water as we are, if not more. I'm involved in an interstate dispute right now between Atlanta and the state of Alabama, for example. It's not that much different than some of the ones that we're dealing with out here in the West. But they just don't have the long experience that we do with how to deal with those. We have a student from uh, India, uh, Delhi, who's uh, he's down in Fort Collins. His job is to work in the Central Water Commission and to do the negotiations with Bangladesh and Nepal on the inter international issues, and they're not that much different than what we're dealing with here. I, I really think that uh, uh, these problems are international <coughs> in scope. Well, the, uh, the stream flow volumes that result from all of that uh, are, are to be expected. The Colorado River is our major one here. Uh, Arkansas is well, it's just as major. The Colorado River gets a lot more publicity. The, the Platte, I mean, it's not even shown on this map, but just look at all the publicity on the Platte in Nebraska and between Wyoming and Nebraska. We're not even showing it on the map. But, uh, of course, the major runoff is the Mississippi River uh, system here. But uh, the result of this aridity in the west is these small volumes of streams. We have... Uh, <clears throat> interesting aquifer systems to deal with. Uh, these are some of the major aquifer systems. Uh, the Ogallala, of course, has been getting a lot of the publicity in uh, recent years. And of course, uh, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> of course, uh, Steve Gloss over here is, the, uh, is very active in trying to mount a research uh, program on the Ogallala, working on legislative issues. I don't know if you've talked about your activities on that, Steve, but uh, uh, that's a very interesting uh, western water issue. <clears throat> uh, we have a lot of small aquifers. This one down here in southern Arizona is very important uh, uh, and is uh, getting a lot of attention for urban development down there. This aquifer looks interesting. That's called the Mississippi Delta region. Uh, there's two Mississippi Deltas. Uh, there is this uh, actual delta here and then there's the delta region of Mississippi which is uh, a place where they're irrigating rice and, uh, and soybeans and other crops, mainly rice, some sugar cane further down, and they're having groundwater overdrafts and problems just like we have in the West. Really interesting to watch that. Here's the same uh, type of a, of a map showing the areas with the uh, serious groundwater overdrafts. Uh, this looks like Colorado is about to be wiped out. We don't feel like we're in quite that bad uh, shape. <laughs> in Colorado, but up here in the Texas Panhandle and in parts of the High Plains, they are having a lot of problems. And this is this Mississippi River area I was talking about. That's the Arizona area. Here's your Southern California uh, area that we were talking about. Major flooding, we don't really have too much in the way of major flooding, uh, although it looks like you do here, but I, I hadn't been reading that much about it in the newspaper, so 
you're classified as having that anyway. But uh, uh, Western water issues are unique in the United States because there's just something about the West that's more dependent on water for our development than the rest of the country. And so if you really evaluate what people are concerned about in the West, they're concerned about water supply. Now, they're concerned about water quality, too. You hear a lot about water quality, but it, water supply is a fractious issue, the difficult problem to deal with in the West, especially in areas with high growth like Colorado and Southern California and uh, Arizona, other major metro areas. I, in, up here in Wyoming, you don't hear the same kinds of water supply issues because you, you don't have the major urban area. But um, some, of the other, some of the conflicts between agriculture and urban areas and between environmental groups and mining and things like that would be similar. But in places where you have the major growth centers, uh, we're really hearing a lot about water supply. And uh, so most of my remarks are going to focus on that topic of water supply. <clears throat> I made a list here of, of major issues, uh, which I would just call Western water issues. And uh, there's about six on here. There are, of course, different ways to classify those. But the six that I thought I would uh, discuss are the conflict between cities and agriculture, some difficulties that we're having in, in federal state uh, relationships, uh, interstate problems, compacts and so on, the public trust doctrine, which I'll explain what that means, the endangered species and in-stream flow con controversies, and then some problems that you see in uh, cities like Denver that uh, go beyond water resources into uh, topics of urban governance and how we can uh, cooperate more in finding regional solutions to problems. And in, in discussing those issues, I'd like to give you a few case studies and examples, mainly from Colorado, of uh, the things that we're, we're facing today. Um, the first one is the cities versus agriculture issue. And uh, I probably look like I'm better organized than I am. I'm not that well organized. But uh, bear with me so that I can find all of my things uh, here. This is what I mean by cities versus agriculture. This is a recent uh, article that appeared in a, a journal called uh, Issues in Science and Technology. <laughs> It says here, <clears throat> Western farmers are diverting vast quantities of water from more sensible and profitable use uses while damaging the environment. Now that would seem to apply to Wyoming as well as Colorado, uh, apply to Nebraska, but uh, I don't know. Uh, do you all agree with that? Probably there's some Western farmers here. You agree with that? Yeah. Well. It turns out that that's, this is a widely held belief. If you go back to Washington and you go to a meeting of federal agencies, they'll tell you that uh, the solution to Western water problems is to stop wasting water in agriculture. Um, let's, uh, you know, we'll just take some of that water from agriculture and we'll divert it to city uses and urban uses and that'll take care of it. And I think I just saw in the uh, Wyoming newsletter that uh, $41 million of projects was approved for Wyoming. Well, if we're wasting water in agriculture, that sounds like we're going to waste another $41 million <laughs> on it. So my conclusion from that is somebody is fooling somebody about this issue. And, of course, this is an article written by this fellow Mark Reisner, who you can see on television programs where, that are produced by environmental groups who want to make points that are environmental points. He's also the author of this well-known book called Cadillac Desert. If you hadn't read that, that's a recommended reading just to see what this side is saying. Well, basically, they're saying that 80 to 90 percent of the water used in the West goes to agriculture. And it's, it's, it's used for low-value uses. It's used for alfalfa, for pasture growth, and and those things generate uh, very few dollars per acre. And if you just divert that water to cities, um, you generate thousands of dollars per acre foot of water rather than hundreds of dollars per acre foot of water. 
And uh, moreover, you might let it run into San Francisco Bay or some nice use like that without using it. And that's a higher value. So we ought to just really put the squeeze on agriculture. Going beyond that, agriculture is subsidized. It pollutes. Uh, and you've got all these farmers in the West that were, um, are using Bureau of Reclamation water. And they're, uh, they're really ripping off the government. And uh, so we need to stop, put a halt to that. Now, I don't think that sells very well in Wyoming. That would be my thought. I think that's, that uh, story would sell a lot better in Southern California than it would sell here because the story, well, like, like many other stories, is just not that simple. There's just a lot more to uh, that question than those simple things. But it is true, of course, that agriculture uh, can get by with less water. And it is true that agriculture pollutes. And it is true that uh, some agriculture is subsidized. And so we need to look closer at that question to come up with some better solutions uh, than we have so far. So my conclusion from that is that the 1990s are going to be an era in the West of a lot more competition in water. We're really going to have to examine what we do with our water and, and the way we develop our water resources. And uh, there's a lot of subjects for research on that. Uh, I could tell you a few that we're looking at in, in Colorado um, to examine that very question. In fact, one of them is very interesting. I, I, I'll tell you about it just to illustrate uh, <clears throat> how the Cadillac Desert side doesn't have the whole story. Uh, when we have our annual water conference, I like to invite an economist to come down and give a talk. Now, we've got one here in the audience. I don't want to say anything bad about economists. In fact, one of those, those that we invite uh, is uh, Ari's major professor, Bob Young. He was your major professor, wasn't he? Yes. And uh, Bob likes to come in to meetings like that and say that uh, uh, you can take water away from agriculture and uh, there won't be very many consequences because we've run our input-output model and it shows that if you divert these many acre feet of water from agriculture to urban uses, there will only be a few jobs lost on the farm and uh, there will be a lot of jobs created in the city, and so it's not any big deal. Well, I think it's more complicated than that, and I I'm, have been working with these economists trying to educate them, and I guess we'll have to keep, keep working on that because my arguments are just not quite good enough yet. We do have a Ph.D. candidate in economics working with us uh, in the Institute now. Uh, he's actually a Chamber of Commerce uh, intern, and it's his job to prepare a, uh, an issue and option paper on uh, the economic impacts and social impacts of diverting water out of northern Colorado into the Denver metro area. And uh, we don't have him convinced yet either, but uh, he's on our payroll, so he's got more incentive than uh, Bob Young does. But um, when Bob gives that speech or another person gives that speech, if one of our major uh, water managers hears that, uh, and I have one water manager in particular in mind. It's Larry Simpson, who manages the uh, Northern Colorado Water Conservancy District. Larry says, well, you just can't look at water in that kind of a gross standpoint. What you've got to realize is that when water is bought to be transferred from agriculture into cities, they don't just go for any water. They don't go for this water which is used in pastures, water which is used for alfalfa. They go for the storage water, you know, the reliable water the water which is held in un until the last minute and used to polish off crops, used to re as reserve for drought to ensure that you've got a crop where you might not have a crop in a drought year. And that water has a tremendous value uh, compared to this water that the economists are running into a, a macro model for that. And uh, we, we need to test that. You know, we need some research on that. <clears throat> but to do that research is going to be very complicated because you've got to go in there with mathematical models, You've got to do case studies of actual ditch systems. You know, you, you really have to get down to the nitty gritty to do that kind of research. And uh, with the paltry budget for water research that we have up down in Colorado, we haven't been able to fund, afford that project yet. That's one of those that I've been trying to get the legislature to fund so that we could test that idea. Um, and uh, that would be a great combined engineering economics project, you know, to do some case studies. And it is true that in southern Colorado, where some of the um, ag water supplies have been bought out. The ones that were bought out were the best ditches and uh, the farming did close down and it has had some devastating impacts on the economy. 
Now, Bob says that would have happened anyway because of the squeeze on agriculture. So uh, th this thing about cities versus agriculture requires a lot more testing than we've been able to give it so far. So that's the first uh, issue. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, let me turn to the next issue. <coughs> when you're on television, you can't clear your throat as, as much because it'll boom in the microphone, but I, I'll just uh, have to apologize for that. The next issue, federal-state relations, is one that we really have to uh, look at closer. And it's, this is an issue of political science related to water resources. <clears throat> and it is fascinating what is going on in the country today. And I want to give you three or four uh, examples to illustrate federal-state relations. The first one is the Two Forks Project in Colorado. The second one is the, the wilderness bills that are in, the, uh, in Congress now, one of them by Senator Worth, one of them by Senator Armstrong. The third one is the uh, uh, Federal Reserve water rights case, which is being tried in the Greeley Water Court now. Very expensive uh, water case there. Uh, we could use the FERC relicensing uh, going on over in Nebraska, which everyone uh, in uh, Wyoming is a, um, who's concerned with the North Platte is thinking about as an issue. And then, of course, endangered species uh, issues in general are all part of that. These are all part of what we call the, the federal-state uh, relationship issue. Now, I'm about to start talking about the Two Forks Reservoir, and probably my time will run out before I get to all of those case studies. So uh, I, I won't be able to discuss all those in detail, but let's just start with Two Forks to show you what we have in mind. And uh, I want to give you, use mainly the uh, newspaper articles as illustrations for Two Forks. Uh, and I, I left one of my best ones back in... Uh, Fort Collins by mistake, but I've got plenty of them to show you. Can we focus on this little map right here? Yeah, right here. This is a pretty good map, I suppose, to show you uh, what, uh, where Two Forks is. Two Forks is a reservoir uh, that would be located on the uh, South Platte River, southwest of Denver. And uh, it's called Two Forks because there's two forks of the uh, South Platte River. There's another one that comes right over here that's not on the map. And, uh, and there's this fork, and uh, it would be a reservoir of about uh, a million and a half acre feet total storage. I, I forgot to look that figure up again. Uh, about a million and a half acre feet of storage. Uh, in, in other words, a big reservoir for Colorado. And it would have a safe yield of about 100,000 acre feet per year. <clears throat> so like many western streams, the ratio of gross storage to safe yield is pretty big. And that's what you have to do in the West because we have erratic flows. You know, that's, I think that would make a good research project also to do a correlation between the statistical uh, properties of hydrologic time series and the ratio of storage to safe yield that you get of Western reservoirs. I, I think that'd be a great hydrologic study for somebody to do. Well, Two Forks is just about to be vetoed, we all think by EPA in spite of a long and checkered history. I'm sure you've been keeping up with it some, so I don't have to tell you the whole thing, but uh, this is probably too wide to get on the whole. No, you can get it on there, can't you? This is the, uh, <clears throat> the Denver Post of uh, August 30th of 89, and since this um, proposed veto of two forks was announced by EPA, uh, they've been going through public comment and all of that, and um, we're still in the public comment. They just extended the uh, public comment 30 days, but in 30 days from now, we should have the final decision of EPA, which we all think will be no, it's vetoed. This has gone all the way to George Bush, uh, and that's President George Bush, not Colorado and George Bush, who was at our groundwater meeting yesterday, who's chairman of our groundwater commission. I mean, to to be involved for president of the United States to be involved in one federal permit illustrates how um, the, 
the, how the process has kind of gotten out of kilter. Well, if you've studied water resources engineering, you've been told, of course, that it takes 20 or 30 years to build a major water resources project. But that was when you could build a major water resources project. Let me just show you the chronology on two forks. This is uh, part of the same article, and uh, this is called the Two Forks uh, Chronology. 1890, the idea of building a dam there was first started. This is a news article of the 1928 newspaper. Uh, we were going to build it in, uh, well, in 1928, they didn't know that they were going to build it in depression, uh, the oppression economy, because the depression hadn't hit yet. But it would have, uh, it would have only cost six million to build it uh, then. Uh, the environmental impact statement that we just uh, prepared for the Corps of Engineers cost $40 million. <laughs> so it cost, it cost uh, five times, six times, seven times, my arithmetic's not good, so good today, seven times as much to do the environmental impact statement in today's prices as it would have cost to build a whole dam in the Depression era. Well, 1931, we got a right away. The Bureau of Reclamation was involved in 66. In 76, here's a bumper sticker that says, Stop Two Forks. Uh, in 82, the Denver Water Department finally got serious about Two Forks, and uh, 40 uh, suburban cities and metro districts got together to form the Metro Water Providers, and they agreed to pay 80% of the Two Forks uh, <clears throat> cost. Now, that's when this EIS process started, and that was when the cost of, the, uh, uh, of this uh, thing really got started. Now, let me just intervene with a little um, uh, point to one other point I've got here, uh, this last one here. You, you remember I said that was one of the issues, urban governance and regionalization. Okay, well, this, this agreement of these 40 suburban cities and water districts together with the Denver Water Department represented a real breakthrough in achieving a goal of water management to have regional cooperation. And they will tell you that the fact that they could get together and agree on a project meant that finally in the Denver metro area there was some chance of coming together and, and working together on a water project. But with this veto, they say that's been destroyed. So what was good for the environment to protect the canyon seems to have been bad for getting together and being efficient, which is another goal of it. Now, uh, of course, they tell you that, but uh, there was just in the newspaper this morning that four other cities in Denver have gotten together and formed the Front Range Water Authority, Thornton, uh, Westminster, Arvada, and uh, Aurora. And uh, those are four fast-growing ones. And you know, up in Fort Collins, we're looking with some trepidation at that because that looks like a powerful North Denver water coalition, which may reach up to take another one of our ditch companies up in Fort Collins. And so these issues really get complicated. Well, let's look at this chronology again here just to get to the end of it. And uh, from 82, uh, when we, they went together, we filed for the uh, Dredge and Fill 404 permit in 86. Now, see, Denver was trying to do things right. They took four years to get ready to file for the permit. Uh, they thought that uh, since Mr. Reagan had just been reelected, probably we were safe. Um, to file for it then, but uh, we didn't realize that we had to go through the Fish and Wildlife Service reviewing the environmental impact and uh, uh, got the endangered species in there. Governor Roy Roma got involved with it. That's a long story. Projects were issued, or permits were issued. In January of 89, the Army Corps of Engineers that has the jurisdiction for uh, the uh, 404 permit said after all this $40 million in EIS and all that, that they would issue the permit. And then that's when the plot got thicker. And this is one of the difficulties in federal state relations. And I, I want to give you a little chronology here that I'll just have to sketch on this pad. So if you could focus on this pad just a minute. Uh, when George Bush took office, that was, um, let's see, that would have been uh, beginning of 89, wouldn't it? So in January of 89, George Bush took office. <clears throat> the Corps said 
that it was going to grant the permit uh, about then. And uh, William Riley was appointed head of the EPA in February of 89 by newly elected uh, President George Bush. Now, inauguration day for George Bush would have been right about here, January of 89. He appointed William Riley head of the EPA. Riley was a um, environmental organization uh, chairman, Conservation Foundation, and uh, <clears throat> he apparently had a tremendous amount of advice from environmental groups saying, veto this thing. It is a, um, an albatross, a monster. And so after a very short period of study in there, he proposed to veto it. Uh, in that August of 89, that time period right about here, that was when that decision was made. So um, it, the announcement that he was going to veto it and the rumors started flying within two weeks after he was appointed. And then that decision was made after various studies and things like that that they did. But it all happened rather quick. And uh, this is the kind of uh, publicity he was going by. Uh, this one says, damn study a monster. This was uh, just a couple of years ago. So uh, the, uh, uh, the 40 million hadn't been reached yet, but that's what environmental groups think about uh, two forks. Very complicated, but the Denver forces are saying that uh, they missed by two weeks getting their permit. Because if they had gotten two weeks in advance of that thing, the Corps of Engineers would have recommended the approval of the permit. They had a director of EPA, I forget who that was, before Riley, who was, who was a Reagan EPA person. They would have approved it, rubber stamped it, and they would have the permit. Now, I don't know if the two weeks is exactly right, but that illustrates what we're dealing with on federal or state relations. Spent $40 million on the EIS, and these decisions are being made politically by environmental groups who have access to the federal agency. EPA. Now, I'm, I'm not you know, an advocate of two forks, but I'm, I'm concerned about this process. In fact, when they first proposed to build two forks, I was mad at, about the Denver Water Department wanting to build it there because I like the canyon. But then when I saw the way the decision process was going, I got mad at the environmental groups because it seemed to me that fair is fair on it. But it, we're not playing fair with that. We're playing very much politically on two forks. The, um, <clears throat> the kinds of media that this uh, generates, it makes great media relationships. Uh, I mean, the media really plays this. Uh, here's an example, uh, a Sunday supplement special from the Denver Post. This was uh, 86. This is Monty Pasco. He's a Denver water lawyer. And uh, he's supposed to be the Two Forks king. Uh, <laughs> he was chairman of the, of the water board at that time. Let me just show you one or two uh, pictures on the inside. Uh, here's Monty on the, uh, on the inside the canyon. So the media is trying to portray him as a latter-day uh, water buffalo type, uh, you know, wanting to build this dam, saying uh, forget the canyon and so on. Monty Pasco started out as an environmentalist. Now he's a water buffalo, so, you know, things, things tend to get polarized a lot. Um, <clears throat> this is interesting. Um, can you focus on this one? The, um, this is an editorial cartoon. You up there, Jeff? Okay. Can you, uh, can you focus down a little closer on that one? Yeah, there, so we can read that. This was uh, 88. And uh, the editorialist uh, is trying to show a little bit of the maze that the poor consumer has to go through today to get a drink of water. It says, how to get a drink of water in Denver. Now, this says Cold Facts Avenue. Of course, that's the main street of Denver. And uh, we won't go through all of this, but uh, it says, go through here. File an environmental impact statement. Take a poll. See what Trout Unlimited thinks, hot or cold. Now, this one was especially interesting. I don't have time to go through it. Governor, hot or cold? Governor Romer turned out to be lukewarm on this, and he has taken flack from both sides really heavy. Move the bighorn sheep. 
you might run into that one up here. Balance West Slope needs. Now, Nebraska doesn't even show up on this, but the Nebraska politics on two forks are really thick. Designated as a scenic river, yes or no? Uh, the water board, what are they going to do? Pay the attorneys, pay them more. <laughs> of that $40 million in environmental impact statement, uh, they got most of it in legal fees. I mean, and you're talking tremendous legal fees on that. When those meters are running for those big law uh, firms, you know, that's a lot per, uh, per hour. And uh, a lot of it went in there. Those are very talented people. Well, here's, uh, here's the latest one. I mean, this is just the other day. This is February, uh, February uh, 21 of 1990. <clears throat> Another federal agency joins EPA. Well, this is the Fish and Wildlife Service. And they want to look at uh, endangered species. Right, now, here is the prairie white fringed orchid, which is down in the Big Bend region of, of, the, of Nebraska, the big, the plat. This is the razorback sucker, uh, which is uh, uh, on the western slope in the Colorado River Basin. And this is the whooping crane, also down in the Nebraska's Big Bend uh, region. Well, you all know where those places are. So let me just recap and summarize uh, on this. If we look at, at um, the South Platte, goes into Nebraska up here. Here's your mountains. Some of the South Platte, some of the Two Forks water would be diverted from the Colorado River Basin here. And that would keep that water from going to Southern California. Well, over here is the, where the Razorback Sucker is. And way over here in Nebraska, in the Big Bend area, let's see, that's supposed to go down like that, isn't it? The Big Bend area, you got the whooping crane and the orchid. Well, my hydrology tells me that the Two Forks is not going to affect that. Um, in fact, uh, Two Forks may even, uh, well, it may provide more reliable flows over here. If we don't have Two Forks, and if all of this is then dried up with the, city, with the uh, cities versus agriculture, probably the impacts over here are going to be worse. Colorado River um, is another story. There would be slightly less water in the Colorado River as a result of that, but uh, not much. And uh, it can certainly be managed. But the point is, and I, and I believe those things have to be studied, the point is there's a third federal agency. We had the Corps of Engineers who studied that in detail. The governor, Governor Roy Romer, met with them, you know, worked with them, tried to get them to, uh, uh, tried to come up with the best decision. After they had come up with their decision, EPA turns around and vetoes it. Governor Romer says that he's upset because he thought he was talking to a decision maker. And he, and he really thought he was, the Corps of Engineers, but they weren't a decision maker. The EPA turned around and vetoed them. And here the Fish and Wildlife Service has the authority to delay this thing more and maybe stop it. So how do you get something done in, in this uh, environment today? Well, this is what I mean by the federal-state relationships. Two Forks is just a, uh, an example of that. Uh, an interesting one and, uh, you know, one that we, uh, we're just going to have to somehow figure out how to deal with. Well, my next... Uh, Example is the uh, interstate issues as something else which is, uh, is happening in the West and uh, interstate issues. And I, I don't have any good uh, aids and pictures to show that, but uh, I think the, the best one would be just to go back to my original map and uh, point out a few things that are going on. Um, of all these rivers, they all have interstate disputes going on today. Um, the Colorado is maybe the best known one because the, uh, the Southern California um, water consumers and the um, Arizona water consumers are so dependent on the Colorado River Basin. Um, the interesting aspect of that is the possibility that the Colorado River Compact would be reopened and we would see new litigation and new arrangements on that. 
we're afraid of that in Colorado, but we don't know um, what might happen in the future because with all the environmental disputes, we seem unable to capture our compact entitlements. Colorado is entitled under the Colorado River Compact to about a million acre feet more than it is using of the Colorado River supplies. <clears throat> but we can't get our hands on it because of these federal state problems and others. And uh, it, it's a real dilemma. Water is, is enormously important in California. Uh, here's one um, little document I brought along from San Diego. Um, this was put out by the San Diego County Water Authority, which is struggling with Los Angeles, you know, trying to get some water for San Diego, uh, where Los Angeles seems to be blocking them at, at different turns that go along. And so Southern California is, is going to be a major battleground, but you're familiar up here with this one on the Platte River system. Uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with the Wyoming, Nebraska North Platte Compact, but I am familiar with the South Platte Compact uh, with Nebraska, and I, and I know that there's a lot going on relative to that relicensing of the uh, power projects and districts over in the, um, on the North Platte and South Platte around uh, Ogallala and North Platte. Uh, probably that's the subject of seminars over here. I don't know, Steve. Has there been seminars on that? Yeah, we've had a couple. I've been a little bit involved in that. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> um, I've been a little bit involved in that um, and uh, have seen enough of the studies to know that that is a very tough issue uh, rivaling two forks um, in terms of, of uh, legal fees, environmental groups, national issues, uh, international issues, interstate compacts. Uh, there's going to be a lot of money spent before we finally settle things on the Platte River system and the Missouri River system. If I had time, I would tell you the history of the Pecos River compact between uh, New Mexico and, and Texas. I don't have time, but uh, that goes all the way back to Billy the Kid. <laughs> Billy, the, the, the main area where the dispute arises is where Billy the Kid lived in southern New Mexico, down, down around Roswell. And um, it's a western river with a lot of ephemeral characteristics. You know, the water here today and gone tomorrow. Very difficult to account for it with the hydrology. The economic impacts are difficult to quantify because it involves a lot of agriculture. And uh, they just finished settling a lawsuit uh, that was filed in 1974 in the Supreme Court. It was just settled this year. It took 15 years to settle it. My duties are part of the settlement. Uh, as the engineer um, judge who makes a ruling once a year on how much water each of the two states gets. Uh, and now Arkansas and Colorado um, is uh, blowing up. There's a lawsuit going on between those two. And uh, I mentioned to you that I was becoming involved in one down here between Atlanta and Florida, Georgia, Florida, and Alabama. It has the same characteristics as these western uh, water disputes. And uh, to resolve those, we need, some, we need more wisdom than we've got. Uh, it doesn't appear that we'll be able to get rid of the lawyers in it. We'd like to, but it doesn't appear that we'll be able to. The public trust doctrine, do you know what that is? You heard of that? I know some of you have, but uh, that's a, um, a real dispute in Western uh, water um, issues that um, we, we need to deal with. And um, in Colorado, you hear that uh, banging loud and clear from the environmental side. And in California, we have got to turn around this old antiquated appropriation doctrine of the West and introduce the public trust doctrine. Now, what the public trust doctrine basically says in a, in a legal uh, way, not any lawyers in here, are they? You know of any, Steve? Because <laughs> if I give a legal opinion on what the, what the public de trust doctrine means, I'm on, my, on legal ground, and you have to watch out. If, you, if you're a water lawyer, you know there's a water engineer. There's a joke that a lot of water engineers become some pretty poor lawyers, you know, because they pretty soon get to thinking that they can practice law. It looks pretty simple when you get into it, but the, you're always on shaky ground with it. The, the public trust doctrine <clears throat> would be one that says 
that in the law, there needs to be um, some things reserved for the public, to be held in trust for the public. Now, in water resources, and in particular with the appropriation doctrine uh, that we have, water is appropriated by the first in time, first in right. Now, that means you can take it all. And under Colorado water law, you have to, there are two things required. You have to divert the water out of the stream, then you have to put it to a beneficial use. Well, if you want to leave it in the stream for the fish, you haven't diverted it, and uh, most people don't agree, well, some people don't agree that it's a beneficial use. I think it's a beneficial use, you know, for in-stream flow. But uh, that's what the public trust doctrine is calling for. They say we've got to adjust this water law so that we can provide for those public interests that are not provided for under the appropriation doctrine. Well, I think you can imagine that if you were an environmentalist who just moved to Boulder from Connecticut, who was that from Connecticut? Somebody from Connecticut. New England, who was that moved from New England? If you just moved from New England, that would sound like a great idea to you, but if you're a farmer uh, in a Platte River and your farm, you've got a thousand acre farm and without the water it's worth $300 an acre, with the water it's worth $2,000 an acre, and you translate what the public trust doctrine is going to do to your water rights into how much water you're going to get in the future as compared to the past, it won't take you very long to run your cash register up to figure out that you've just lost about, just take a number, $500,000 off of your family's wealth. Well, what are you going to do? You're going to fight against that public trust doctrine. And so we see, you know, tremendous uh, conflict in Colorado over the public trust doctrine. And in California, you hear about it. But uh, most people agree that something needs to be done to balance the interests. But we hadn't found out how yet. Our speaker at lunch yesterday, who was uh, chairman of the Arapaho County uh, Water Authority of south of Denver, was talking about that, coming up with a way to balance those public interests. But, um, <clears throat> and I'm, I've been trying to tell, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> been trying to tell the Colorado legislature that if they'll give us some money to do some research, we'll find out some ways to do that. <laughs> But uh, that's an awful big promise to make because there's so much conflict in water resources. Well, the other item that I had listed for issues was endangered species, and I gave you a little sample of that over the, uh, uh, the whooping cranes and the orchid and the squawfish. And then on the uh, urban governance and regionalization, just a little issue related to that uh, in terms of that Denver area uh, water providers organization. So I really don't have time to talk more about that. Those are all issues. Um, we could say a lot about them. And then, of course, I haven't even included water quality on my list, and it is a big issue to deal with, and we're going to be dealing with it in Colorado. But I think I'll uh, conclude, and, and we have any questions or discussion that you might like to have, and then include that on the tape for, for the time that we have for the tape. Any questions or discussion? Surely somebody's got a question for me after all those provocative statements. Here's one. Didn't include Indian water rights. I, yeah, I, did, I forgot to include Indian water rights, and uh, that uh, is an issue in Colorado, mainly in the southwest corner. And uh, when I say western water issues, I'm kind of starting with my own experience in Colorado. In other places, it'd be a much bigger issue. That's right. That ought to be added to the list. Other questions or comments? Well, if you don't ask me any, I might ask you some. Steve? Let me just make a point of clarification. Uh, you said quite correctly that we indicated there's $41 million in water development projects being funded this year in uh, Wyoming. Um, I guess what isn't evident from that is that probably 75% of those are municipal water supply projects okay. that aren't uh, your typical storage and so forth. And so okay. there's a, I think there's a fairly common perception out there that when people see those numbers, they assume it's a dam here or there or somewhere. But okay. So it's, uh, it's a little different mix of projects than you might imagine. I only read the headline on your newsletter, so I'm glad you clarified that. I, did, I wasn't sure what they were. <clears throat> okay, questions? Are, yes. Do you think that uh, development of groundwater storage could eventually take the place of uh, surface water reservoirs? And is that a, an option to building two forks or, or that type of thing? 
Well, we, we think uh, it, it has a lot of promise. And in, in, in our two-day conference that uh, Steve just alluded to, um, we just had some great papers about uh, things that are happening in Colorado to investigate the use of groundwater. But it's difficult to recharge those aquifers. Uh, that's not as easy uh, for a number of reasons as most people think. Um, and I invited our main environmentalist, uh, the, the one who drove the nails in the coffin of Two Forks uh, to uh, uh, speak at our conference, Dan Lukey. And uh, I asked Dan if he wouldn't make some comments about how that groundwater could be used instead of Two Forks. Well, Dan made about 15 minutes worth of comments and then left. Uh, and uh, I'm going to have to talk to him some more about that. We want to hear some more details. And uh, I, I really do think it has a lot of promise. And if it was all left up to me, I'd like to go out there and develop ways to recharge those aquifers and to use those instead of surface water uh, storage devices. But uh, w I think it's more difficult than, than we believe that it is. And things like water quality, uh, the requirements uh, on water quality from recharging aquifers are real stringent. And demonstration projects that we have going on, they're using uh, water. They're having to pump water right out of the aquifer and then recharge it again just so it's the same water, so we don't introduce the water quality question. It's a tough question. You put that water in there, you have chemical reactions. You might clog up the aquifer, all kinds of things there. That's a real good area for research, though. I was real encouraged after this conference is all the work that we've got to do in the research area. I talked to one of our state senators afterwards and was giving him some of the uh, enthusiasm of it, and he wanted to get a summary of the conference so he could look at some things to introduce, and maybe we could get some uh, more demonstration, more research on, on that from that. They're doing a lot of groundwater recharge in China. I was in China three years ago, and I was really impressed with some of the groundwater recharge that's being done in China. But they, not able, they don't have to worry about all the red tape that we have to worry about. They can cut through that red tape sometimes and do things if the uh, authorities want to do it. We have a lot more difficult time here on those kinds of things. All right. Well, Neil, how much is uh, agricultural water worth, and at what point do you look at transferring agricultural water or building a dam? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the question from the economist, isn't it? <clears throat> Well, it's worth, it sells for, uh, in northern Colorado, about $1,000 an acre foot right now for good, reliable, big Thompson water. And of course, uh, an acre foot, it takes three uh, uh, acre feet to farm most acres. And so you need $3,000 in capital investment under those prices to uh, put the water onto the land. And the crops are not worth that much. So the people who are still farming are using water that they already had. And so if the offers are made at that level or higher to buy it off, they uh, can always afford to buy it. You know, the, 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 I don't dispute the research that shows the uh, return from an acre foot of water in agriculture versus the cities or industrial uses. I don't dispute that at all. Uh, the, uh, what I have trouble with is under our conflict approach to water resources that uh, when the, the purchases are made, they go in there in a, in a divisive way, uh, like they did on the Thornton uh, water purchase, secretive, uh, uh, not, uh, not uh, providing for the farmer who doesn't want to sell, and, um, and not cooperating with the neighbors. And they have to do that because um, the political aspects of water development are so, uh, are so um, uh, divisive that, that you can't do it without the secretive approach. What we need is an open, balanced way so that we could transfer the water and also continue to provide for the agricultural region. And then that, that pushes a button that I'm very interested in, which is called rural stabilization. Because I think if the water is bought off in a, uh, in a raid way, a rural area is going to lose their vi uh, viability and vitality. The farmers who are tired of fighting that, they're ready to sell. Some of them are. And so it's divisive farmer versus farmer. And, and, and it's those kind of social issues that bother me about it. So at what point you get ready, I w that you, do you do it? I say you do it when you can provide for the rural stabilization and for the urban water. And I, I'm really optimistic. I think in the future we're going uh, to have some ways that we can take the agricultural water, 
provide it to the cities in dry periods, have arrangements between them. I think they're going to see all kinds of innovative things like you've been working on on your research. I, I think the political climate is improving on that. Other questions? Well, Steve's getting nervous over here. If we don't get another question, that he might blow the whistle on it. I might have to ask one myself. All right. uh, let me just comment while people think about another question. We have a couple of copies of the proceedings from this uh, groundwater conference, which unlike many other conferences that are held, was put together and printed uh, before the conference was held, so it's immediately available to people interested. We also have a, uh, a short evolving white paper that the uh, chief of the Office of Groundwater and EPA is putting together, which largely addresses uh, state-federal uh, relationships in, uh, in the areas of groundwater quality and so forth. And if that's of interest to anybody, we have those available at the center. And there's really good proceedings, too. <clears throat> yeah, I was just going to ask about that public uh, trust doctrine idea. Could you kind of, could you say water on public lands or relate it somehow like that, like federal lands and have water reserved for the public that way? Or I don't know how you'd. Well, you, you, that's uh, in, a, in a sense what the Forest Service is trying to do in that one problem I was telling you about called the Federal Reserve Water Rights. And the water is usually diverted up high, uh, as it has to be, to arrive at, our, uh, at the farms and everything. And so when you have that Federal Reserve Water Rights, even though it might be on public land, it's taken away from the private users. What I think the solution has to be is that more agencies have to get into the water management business. I want to see the parks and recreation and fisheries get into the water management business, use leased water make arrangements with people and provide that water without just taking it like that. And then I think we can get into it. But that's going to require more water management rather than less. So these people who say that the prior appropriation doctrine is all you need, I think they're all wet. Let me just interrupt for a second. We can certainly continue questions, but I think our <coughs> tape's just about over. And before Neil begins to flutter on the screen up there, I'd like you to uh, join me in thanking him for a very good presentation. Thank you. Thank you.